Hello, everyone. I'm Rob Satloff, director of the Washington Institute, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this very special Washington Institute Policy Forum, uh, just uh, about 48 hours before President Biden uh, embarks on his journey to the Middle East. Uh, this is much anticipated. Uh, three of my very special colleagues from around the world, this is a very international policy forum in order to set the table, as it were, for the Biden visit, um, outline what the issues are, what the environment is in the countries that he'll be visiting, what are the likely topics of discussion with leaders, what are the expectations, and hopefully what are the outcomes and the repercussions policy in the Middle East. Before we go to my colleagues, um, just a couple of words. First, um, I urge you, when we're all done with today's event, I urge you to please go to the webpage of the Washington Institute, www.washingtoninstitute.org, to take a look at the analysis and insight, analysis that, uh, that won't make it into today's session, but that is brilliant and deserves to be read. Uh, by my colleagues David Makovsky and David Schenker, Rachel Ben Fishman, Simon, and others. All dis different acts of, of um, Biden Middle East trip. Um, I'd like to invite all of you, whether you're on the platform, platform to try to get into conversation. Um, those of you who have followed the routine or on Zoom, go to the bottom of your feel free to put a question in the Q and of Zoom. If you're not, if you're one of the hundreds it appears that uh, we have lost Rob. Uh, and I think what he was saying, are you back, Rob? What Rob was saying is that if, uh, for those who are tuning in on this, you can pose questions when this is over on the Q&A function. Rob, are you, are you with us? I, I see you. And okay, so, go ahead. Yeah, sorry about that. So you can uh, use the Zoom function or email me directly at rsatloff at washingtoninstitute.org. With that, we're going to turn to my colleagues. First, from Israel, I'm delighted to welcome Professor Tamar Herman. She's the Senior Research Fellow at the Israel Democracy Institute, Director of its Viterbi Family Program on Public Opinion and Policy Research, and by far one of the um, uh, one of the finest and best respected uh, pollsters um, and ex explainers of Israeli public opinion. Tamar will give us a sense and what the politics is in Israel as it not only welcomes Biden, but enters yet another election campaign. Tamar, the floor yours. I start by presenting uh, five challenges to this visit, and then I have uh, unfortunately only four opportunities for this uh, visit. And I'll uh, uh, look at it from the public opinion uh, perspective, of course. So the first challenge is that there is so much noise right now in Israel because of the transition government, because of the upcoming elections, because uh, parties are uh, uh, uniting or dissolving, and, and, and it is not quite clear what the political background uh, now uh, is. And the attention of uh, the public is much more to the domestic issues rather than to the international environment and uh, the, the surrounding. And uh, this is something that uh, uh, plays against uh, the visit because 
it seems to be in a way uh, not in the right time for people to really think about the issues that will be put on uh, the table. The second challenge is that the Palestinian issue is no longer on the table for a number of years now. Uh, in, in the last uh, uh, four elections, we haven't heard much discussion of the uh, Palestinian issue or the possible solutions for the conflict between Israel and, and, and the Palestinians. And I'll show you in a minute what the expectations of the people are in, in this sense. So uh, the raising of the Palestinian issue seems again to be a bit out of context or at least unrealistic from the point of view of the average Israeli, if there is such a thing as an average Israeli. Then uh, third, uh, the local media or the national media in Israel amplifies uh, for a couple of years now, the progressive voices of the Democratic Party. And therefore, Biden as a Democratic president is in a way suspected uh, for serving this kind of agenda in his own party. He is looked upon as uh, not, uh, uh, of course, a member of the progressive part of the Democratic Party, but as a leader who has to keep his party together and therefore can or should make some concessions for uh, this part of the party, uh, particularly if, if elections are coming uh, in the horizon. The fourth uh, challenge is the Iranian challenge. As you'll see uh, in a minute, uh, most Israelis think that the United States and Israel do not see eye to eye on this very critical issue. And, and, and therefore, again, there is some suspicion here that uh, um, if some uh, aspects of the Iranian issue are going to be negotiated, it will not be on equal footing from uh, the point of view of the American negotiators and the Israeli negotiators during uh, uh, this visit. Last but not least, we should not forget that Biden uh, presidency comes after Trump's presidency, which was very popular in Israel. I mean, like it or not, President Trump was very popular in Israel and, and Biden is less popular, he is not as unpopular as President Obama was, but still there is an issue here. It doesn't come easy for many uh, Israelis after years uh, of being pampered by uh, President uh, um, Trump. What are the opportunities? And we'll come to the data shortly. There is much uh, support on the Israeli Jewish side for the Abraham Accords. And therefore, the Saudi uh, uh, option is looked upon very favorably by uh, uh, the Israeli public. They are looking forward for some breakthrough, and they believe, uh, at least uh, to an extent, that it is possible during this visit to open the door for something. It is not quite clear what does it mean, this something, but it is on the positive side. Um, second, uh, there is a sense in Israel that the Biden administration uh, did not put much pressure on Israel on sensitive issues like the settlements, and therefore people are more open to listen because they don't expect it to end with some very harsh policies on Washington's side. And uh, uh, the third uh, opportunity is that uh, the, the parties of the center and the left are looking for uh, some renewed agenda because uh, uh, there is no agenda, as I mentioned, uh, for the Middle East in the last three or four years. And therefore, this might be an opening. Uh, and indeed, in his first speech, uh, Prime Minister Lapid spoke about the Palestinian issue, which uh, had not been mentioned for years in the speeches of the heads of the state. Now I'll try and share with you some data in order to uh, really uh, uh, stand behind what I'm uh, uh, showing you. And 
this is just to explain to you what is the construction of the political scene in Israel right now. This is June uh, last month. 62% defined themselves as being on the right, 24 at the center and 11 on the left. So if someone is expecting uh, a total uh, uh, transformation in the upcoming elections in the construction of the political scene, uh, they are over optimistic. Now, support for the two-state solution, as you can see amongst the Israeli Arab there is still a, a significant majority supportive of the two-state solution. However, amongst the Jews, we see only 32%, less than one-third supportive of uh, the uh, two-state solution. On the right, 18%, at the center, 55%, and 80% on the left. But as I showed you, the left is only 11%, okay? So their impact on the national policy in this regard is not going to be uh, very strong in the uh, upcoming uh, period. Now, what are the chances that we will see a, a, a peace accord uh, with the Palestinians? Uh, as you can see, both the Jews and the Arabs are very, very pessimistic. 91% of the Jews say very slight chances or no chances at all. 50, 56 actually said no chances at all. And also amongst the Arabs who are very supportive of the two-state idea, they are not optimistic that something is going to move ahead with uh, uh, the uh, Palestinian uh, uh, side. Do they believe in President Biden's ability to bring about a breakthrough on negotiations between Israel and the Palestinians? Here you can see 80% uh, saying no. They do not expect him to deliver on that, not because he is not willing to deliver, but because they don't believe that peace is in the cards with the Palestinians in the next five years. It is a structural issue. It is not a political issue. And therefore, even if he'll do his best, his ability to fight against reality is perceived as limited. So uh, uh, the expectations that there will be a significant breakthrough with the Palestinians is quite minimal. As you can see, very much 2%, only 9%, quite a lot. So this is uh, probably the 11% that we saw on the left in one of my previous uh, slides. Now, believing President Biden's ability to bring a, a breakthrough with uh, uh, the Palestinians, by parties, as you can see, left 51%, even on the left, they don't have high expectations uh, as well as on the center, very low expectations on the right and amongst the ultra-Orthodox uh, uh, parties. What about Saudi Arabia? Here, Israelis are more uh, optimistic. Actually, they are split almost in the middle, 44% here, 44% there. So there is an opening here for some good news coming with uh, uh, this uh, uh, venue and uh, adventure. And I think that uh, 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 this is something to focus on uh, when uh, the president makes his speeches or when he addresses the Israeli public, because there is hope here uh, the way there was no hope with the uh, uh, Palestinians. Do they trust uh, the Biden administration uh, for taking Israel's interest into account with regard to the overall relations between Israel and the US? Well, it is not that uh, uh, rosy. As you can see, more think that uh, uh, not so much, they don't trust the administ this administration so much, or even not at all. Uh, and this is in the, the very general sense of the Israeli-American uh, uh, relations. And I think that this would be my last slide and more de most depressing slide. Trust the, the Biden administration to take Israel's interest into account with regard to the policy, to the negotiations with Iran over the nuclear deal. Here we see three quarters saying, no, this administration doesn't take Israel's interests into account with regard to the negotiations with Iran. 
So uh, um, I would say that uh, I'm sure that Israelis will be very welcoming. They will wave these uh, small flags uh, well, through the streets of Jerusalem. When he drives through the streets of Jerusalem, uh, the politicians will be very polite. They'll try to get some op photo ops with President Biden. But I think that there are no real expectations that they this visit would go beyond the symbolic uh, gesture of friendship on sides of uh, the Americans. Terrific. Thank you for that, uh, that very, very useful presentation setting the stage for what Israelis are expecting, or in this case, not expecting from, uh, from the president's visit. Um, I'm now going to turn to Dennis, uh, my colleague Dennis Ross, Ambassador Dennis Ross, um, the Davidson Distinguished Fellow at the Washington Institute and uh, the Institute's counselor. Dennis has been uh, traveling throughout the Middle East, spending quite a bit of time in Israel, uh, talking with Israeli leaders of all political stripes, um, uh, in and out of government, uh, uh, national security um, officials, um, uh, politicians, um, and probably an ordinary person or two every now and then. Um, so uh, uh, Dennis has, uh, um, uh, I think, great insight into what's happening in both um, Israel and Washington and back and forth. Um, and I know that Dennis has also been in the Gulf recently. So um, uh, this is a great opportunity to, um, to have a, a new, um, from an Okay, is thanks, Rob. Look, I, thanks. I, what I'd like to do is focus a little bit more on what's the American perspective going into the trip. Uh, and uh, I think it sets a useful context and it does relate in some ways to what Tamar said, especially at the end on Iran. And I'll raise that at the end. But I, I want to focus a little bit more, again, on, on how the administration approaches the region. We look at what President Biden wrote in his article explaining the trip. Uh, and he, in that article, he emphasizes that he's going to promote stabilization and peace in a region that is characterized by conflict. And he is acknowledging that because of those conflicts, uh, we have an interest. We have an interest in stabilizing things. Those conflicts give rise to great disruptions. Those conflicts give rise to mass refugee flows. Uh, the region is a region characterized by terror. We still have a presence because we're dealing with ISIS. All these factors come into play, uh, and he uses them to explain why he's making this trip now, and including why he's going to Saudi Arabia. What is interesting is that if you go back 18 months, it's not that those factors didn't exist, but somehow the administration was not putting a premium on those factors, wasn't making the region a priority. Its priorities, for understandable reasons perhaps, were domestic related. Obviously, we were still dealing with the nature of the pandemic at its height. There were economic consequences from that. But internationally, the focus was on China. Uh, it was not on the Middle East. To the extent to which the Middle East played at all, it was related to the administration's desire to get back into the JCPOA for the express purpose of putting the Iran nuclear issue back in the box so we wouldn't have to deal with the region. Recall that it took five weeks before the president spoke to any leader from the region. He was speaking to leaders internationally in every other region, but he wasn't speaking to, to leaders from the region because the Middle East was not a priority. So what's changed? Well, the key change I would submit is uh, Vladimir Putin's decision to invade Ukraine. Uh, it is obviously at one level, it's highlighted the issue of, of oil in a way that wasn't the case before. Uh, as we try to deny uh, revenue for the Russians so they can continue to fight what amounts to a war of attrition with Ukraine, we have an interest in trying to find ways to replace Russian oil. That has clearly created more of an interest uh, in Saudi Arabia than was the case before. Uh, but I would say it's it's broader than that. I would say that you have uh, you have the president looking geopolitically now. He sees that we have this longer-term competition with Russia. Uh, that is obviously connected to the longer-term competition with China. The two seem to be in league, at least insofar 
as they're trying to prevent America from doing something that the president often talks about, preserving a rules-based international system. They have a very different concept of what those rules should be. And the president sees us involved in a longer-term competition. Now, in that longer-term competition, Saudi Arabia becomes important. It's important generally because it offers a set of resources that can add to the weight of a coalition that we need to, to shape in terms of competing with the Russians and the Chinese. But it's also important in a larger sense as it relates not just to the geopolitics, uh, but also to the whole question of climate change uh, and to the transition away from fossil fuels. I think the president is more acutely aware of how you manage that transition. He's more acutely aware of the possible disruptions. Uh, the fact is the transition from fossil fuels is gonna take at least two decades. We don't want it to be characterized by disruptions where every once in a while we're now dealing with $5 a barrel, $5 uh, gallons of gasoline. Obviously that's the reality right now. If you wanna manage the stable transition away from fossil fuels, once again, you need Saudi Arabia. Uh, so from a geopolitical standpoint, from the standpoint of, of managing uh, this transition from fossil fuels, from the standpoint of creating uh, alternatives, renewables, but also alternatives. One of the things the Saudis and the Emiratis are doing is investing very heavily in green hydrogen. This is also an area where the administration and the United States can be cooperating as a way, not just of managing the transition, but hastening a day when there are alternatives to fossil fuels. So I think that's probably the key factor that has helped to produce uh, more of a focus on the Middle East, a greater recognition of its importance, and certainly a greater recognition of the importance of Saudi Arabia. So when we look at this trip more specifically, what is the president hoping to achieve? Well, obviously there is this issue beyond uh, stabilization. He wants to promote normalization. Uh, he is talking about that. He's talked about how Again, one of the reasons he's going to Saudi Arabia is precisely because the Israelis have been urging it. I think this issue of normalization needs to be divided into two parts. One part is related to security. And we now see increasing talk about a Middle East air defense alliance. Uh, this is being publicly stated for the first time. Uh, there is no question that part of, the, part of what the president's gonna try to do on this trip, and he will talk about is creating greater security architecture for integration uh, of, the, of the different military forces, at least to begin with providing early warning, uh, being able to put everybody in the same position where they all have the, the same radar, where they, can, they are aware of the launches or they're aware of any projectiles that are headed their way. If it comes to ballistic missiles, uh, if it comes to cruise missiles, uh, those uh, trajectories can be tracked there can be interception points. The whole idea is to create greater integration uh, of the capabilities that exist in the region. The United States has provided large numbers of Patriot missiles, large numbers of SAD anti-missile missiles. Uh, we are not in a position to provide many more, but the numbers that exist in the region today, if they're pooled in an integrated way, are more than sufficient to, to deal with the threats. The threats that are coming from Iran, the threats that are coming from Iran's proxies and the like. Uh, one thing for the region that should be important for those who question whether or not the United States will be there, the more we create an integrated uh, approach to defense, certainly starting with early warning and air and missile defense, the more the U.S. is embedding itself in the region. So those who question whether or not we will still be there, an integrated approach to, to defense and to security is almost a guarantee that the U.S. will be more there. It is an argument as well for the countries in the region to do more, to cooperate, to integrate among themselves. This will clearly be one element of the president's agenda. Uh, the other element of the president's agenda on normalization relates very much to how can you build what is uh, the reality of the Abraham Accords? How do you widen it? How do you deepen it? Now, Saudi Arabia is not going to join the Abraham Accords uh, on this visit. But again, we're likely to see some signs uh, of movement, at least to greater Israeli-Saudi, uh, more overt connections. There is a symbolism involved with the president flying directly from Israel to Jeddah. Uh, but you will also see, no doubt, I think coming out of this trip, 
probably an agreement on Israeli overflight for, for El Al, probably an agreement uh, on uh, direct flights for Israeli Arabs to go to Saudi Arabia for the Hajj. There may be, I know something I've been actively pushing and I know there's an interest in, I would like to see the Saudis finance uh, investment uh, in water infrastructure in the West Bank. That is something that would meet an acute Palestinian need in the West Bank. Uh, they have acute water problems. There is investment in wastewater treatment plants and trunk lines, which would dramatically increase the availability of water. None of that can be done unless there is direct work with the Israelis. So this may not be what is seen as a kind of political normalization, but it is a very practical normalization in which Saudi Arabia and Israel would be working together directly, not below the radar screen, uh, but in the service of increasing what would be water availability for Palestinians. And I highlight this because it is a way to create greater direct contact uh, and work between Israelis and Saudis, but is also a way for the Palestinians to benefit. The Palestinians obviously looked at the Abraham Accords as being negative because it reversed their paradigm. Their paradigm was uh, occupation ends first and then there's normalization. They haven't taken advantage of what was available. The irony, of course, is what the UAE did. The UAE conditioned full normalization on the Israelis not annex the ter annexing the territory allotted to it under the, under the Trump peace plan. Here was a case where what the UAE was doing was, was preventing Israel from taking a negative step towards the Palestinians, but because it's, it inverted in the Palestinian eyes the traditional paradigm, they've rejected it. There is much they can gain by being more open to what is Arab outreach to Israel and steps Israel might take as a result with the Palestinians. This is a way to break the stalemate between Israelis and, and Palestinians at a time when more direct Israeli-Palestinian negotiations uh, would not, first, they're not, it's not so clear they're in the offing, and secondly, even if there were, there's very little prospect they would change anything. But this is something new, and this can change, and I do believe one of the products of the, of the Biden visit is going to be a step-by-step -step approach uh, between the, the Saudis and the Israelis. Much is done below the radar screen. I think we will begin to see a step-by-step -step approach uh, that is above the radar screen. Okay, what about in Israel? Uh, I'll make two basic points here. One, Tamar made a reference to it. She showed it in her, uh, in her polling. Obviously, Iran will be an issue. It'll be an issue in Saudi Arabia as well, uh, but the, the U.S.-Saudi relationship is really what's much more on the table within Saudi Arabia. In Israel, there is the general principle of security, uh, but there's also this, and the American commitment to it, but there's also this issue of how to deal with the Iranian threat, and particularly how to deal with the Iranian nuclear issue. Here, there will continue, I suspect, to be a difference, although I think there'll be a managing of the difference. The U.S. and Israel agree on Iran can never have a nuclear weapon. They disagree on what's the best tactical approach to ensuring that. The administration still believes that while the JCPOA is not a great option, it's the least bad of all options. The question is, is the JCPOA something that is retrievable? Uh, so far, the Iranians are negotiating in a way that suggests they're in no hurry uh, to go back to it. And in the meantime, they continue to build uh, and advance their, their nuclear program. So the Israeli question for the, for the president is going to be, the Iranian nuclear program is marching ahead. They're enriching to 60 percent. They're using advanced centrifuges to enrich to 20 percent. They are shrinking their breakout time to close to zero. Uh, the JCOPA, JCPOA we think is flawed, but in any case, it doesn't exist. And in the meantime, the Iranian nuclear program pushes ahead. So what are your options now to affect the Iranian calculus? We, the Israelis, will say we believe in increasing the pressure on the, on the Iranians so they understand increasingly the consequence of the current track they're on not only economically, but, temp but potentially militarily as well, that they could lose their nuclear infrastructure. What is your approach now? This will be a major part of the discussions uh, with the president uh, on what comes next. Uh, they are dealing with a president who has a deep emotional commitment to Israel. Uh, he is referred to himself uh, as a Zionist. Uh, Zionism, in his eyes, represents what is the national liberation movement uh, of the Jewish people. He is deeply committed to Israel, and I'll tell a story and I'll wrap up with this, because this, 
embodies who he is and it will come through in the way he talks when he's in Israel. Uh, in, in 2002, at the height of the Second Intifada, uh, I happened to be in Israel, I happened to be in Jerusalem, I happened to be at the King David Hotel and there was nobody there. I came down for breakfast Nobody, for people who've been there, they know this is always a very crowded scene. There was nobody there except for two people, Joe Biden and Tony Blinken. And I went and I sat with them and I, and I said, yeah, I know why I'm here. Why are you here? And Biden said, this is the time when friends of Israel need to be here. That's who Joe Biden is. That will come through. Tomorrow I saw the doubts uh, about the questions about uh, how well the U.S. will take Israeli concerns into account on Iran and other issues, Biden will go, I think, to great lengths to simply convey who he is on this visit. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see what kind of an impact that has in Israel as a result. I'll stop there. Very good. Thank you very much, Dennis. Um, uh, again, let me just remind everyone, uh, if you want to get into our conversation, please uh, use the Q&A bar, the Q&A function in the bottom of your Zoom bar, or email me directly at rstatloff at washingtoninstitute.org. Um, I'm delighted now uh, to turn our focus to uh, Iptis Amalekhetpi, the, uh, the founder and president of the Emirates Policy Center, and uh, one of the uh, most insightful voices for, throughout the Arab world on strategy, politics, um, and uh, foreign and foreign relations. Um, we we should we should have said at the outset, of course, the Biden trip has, in my view, four parts: you know, U.S. Israel, U.S. Palestinian, U.S. Saudi, and U.S. Arab more broadly. Um, of course, uh, 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 Arabs are going to be watching all parts of this to look for hints of where the president um, is on a wide array of issues. But there are very specific aspects for the other Arab countries, not just Saudi Arabia, um, that will be all coming together in Jeddah on the last day of the Biden visit. Um, so to get perspective on expectations, hopes, um, uh, fears perhaps, I'm delighted to introduce uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Ibn Samuel Ketbi. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Rob, and thanks for the Washington Institute for Near East uh, Policy. Well, uh, U.S. President Biden visit to Middle East this week is undoubtedly a precious opportunity for, for the region to express its belief in strengthening its friendship and, and long-standing strategic partnership with the world's most powerful country. Uh, they look at it as this is a uh, an historical visit that should be welcomed warmly and America's regional allies, particularly in, in UAE, will know um, that it can contribute towards bringing Washington relationship in the region to a new level. A, a more robust foundation for US alliances here would be better reflect mutual interests and consolidate regional security. In, in light of continuing uh, shifts in the, in the regional and global strategic environment, this is more important now than uh, ever before. As uh, per Mr. Biden previous statement, uh, his visit, which comes before the uh, upcoming US midterm election, will focus on the potential and promising emerging from the Middle East new dynamics. The Abraham Accord are prime example. They have uh, generated an unprecedented uh, level of cooperation between Arab countries and Israel. And it's likely therefore that major focus uh, of the US president tour will be on developing a, a new understanding and regional partnership. This uh, includes not only security, but also other areas like clean energy and, and food and, and water security. Hopefully, 
uh, the the visit will solidify the U.S. strategy for burden sharing, which is essential to creating uh, more efficient and credible tools uh, to safeguard Washington and its allies' uh, interests. Um, there is in, in this visit a great opportunity for instance to uh, consolidate the NACAB forum as an annual uh, summit that can bring more Middle uh, East countries together in area uh, that go beyond their immediate uh, economic and security needs and uh, create uh, more, a more uh, sustainable uh, modus uh, vivendi for uh, the region's people. The first Naqab uh, forum took place in Israel in March uh, of last year and brought together the foreign ministers of Bahrain, Israel, Morocco, and UAE, as well as the US Secretary uh, of State. It was a uh, uh, watershed event uh, establishing a new framework for regional cooperation. The participants agreed to, to, to form six working groups on clean energy, uh, education, and um, coexistence, food, uh, water security, health, regional security, and tourism. That work should be uh, continue if we want to move to uh, other step. So uh, strengthening regional cooperation between Arab countries and Israel seems a promising development and it comes with a great expectation, but it is also essential not to lose sight of other issues. Now, one of the critical challenges of uh, meeting the demands of political settlements for the Palestinian-Israeli conflict uh, reducing tensions and escalation, and uh, involving the Palestinian in current and future regional cooperation efforts. Without this, a, a, a comprehensive and sustainable regional peace will, will remain uh, elusive. Another challenge is Iran, regional behavior. Uh, uh, Dennis mentioned the Iran uh, uh, nuclear uh, program. Uh, the members of uh, GCC and the Arab countries still uh, advocate a diplomatic approach with Iran, including economic uh, diplomacy, rather than uh, the use of military uh, option. Because, you know, military options, the Iranian retaliation will be not against US, will be not against Israel, it will be against GCC. And that's why we are trying to avoid uh, a war with Iran by any means. At the same time, GCC needs to be assured about uh, the peaceful nature of Tehran's nuclear program. Uh, the same goes uh, for its uh, ballistic uh, missiles uh, program and hard from uh, and of course, it's drawn programs and hard from uh, regional uh, malign policies. And it is the hope of many here that Mr. Biden visit will strengthen UAE and, and GCC security and defense capabilities against missiles, uh, drones, and other uh, emerging threats and enhance US GCC ties. Many also wants to see the visit uh, earmark a new approach uh, to regional security when that uh, combine uh, deterrence with containment, de-escalation policies and uh, consolidated economic solution. This would be uh, a preload to promoting security and expanding cooperation between Arab countries, including Palestinians, but also with Turkey and, 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 and Israel. It is important to clearly outline the benchmark for a successful visit uh, by Mr. Biden to, in particular, 
stand out. The first is whether it results in the creation of a solid approach uh, to addressing Iranian threats while also maintaining diplomatic engagement with Tehran and preventing regional conflicts. If the US uses its influence to contain Iran and integrate Iran into the diplomatic path, the US burden sharing strategy will receive a strong push from uh, its allies in the uh, region. The second benchmark is whether or not it will clarify contour of US uh, policy concerning China and Russia that take into account the interest of the uh, Arab state, the, the desire of uh, GCC countries, as well as other allies of the US is to maintain strategic balancing in their policies will depend on a great extent on the nature of US commitment towards the security and, and interest of those part, uh, partners and border regional uh, stability. We don't want to be the battlefield of this competition between the great uh, powers. Uh, the last point is that the Middle East has made great strides in, in regional cooperation and coexistence recently. Many of the uh, building blocks for peace are there, but the US still has a very large role to play in strengthening uh, the fundamentals of the evolving peace. And it can do so by showing that its commitment to, the, uh, to its allies is both unwavering and in touch with their uh, needs and concerns. So Mr. Biden visits, provides a much needed opportunity uh, to achieve this. The challenges is there, but uh, uh, the, uh, this, uh, this administration should balance between opportunities and uh, the challenges. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ibtissam. Very useful. Um, all right, so I'm going to make some comments uh, based largely on uh, uh, observations from a trip that I just concluded a couple of days ago uh, to Saudi Arabia, uh, uh, which follows on previous engagements with, uh, with Saudis and, and Americans focused on the U.S.-Saudi relationship. Um, I was in Riyadh and Jeddah, um, where the president will be. Um, uh, I will say that obviously people in Saudi Arabia are very polite, but uh, as uh, some pointed out to me, they're not wallflowers. They give as good as they take. Um, in my view, Joe Biden made a series of what I believe are unfortunate statements characterizing his trip. Uh, that he is not actually coming to meet the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, though he will in indeed meet him. That he's coming because Israelis asked him to come. But we wish had their own tough comments um, about, uh, about President Biden. Uh, such as uh, the Atlantic interview in which the Crown Prince said he doesn't really care what the President of the United States has to say. Uh, put all that aside, and my view, it's as much uh, expectation as it is hope, is that uh, when he gets to Jeddah, um, he will find um, hosts who want a successful visit, uh, not least because a visit will showcase the convening power that uh, Mohammed bin Salman has, uh, both to have the president visit and to be able to bring together um, the GCC and three other Arab leaders um, to meet with Biden. Uh, and he will therefore be reveling in the meaning of a presidential visit, especially um, with the president whose picture with MBS will itself be worth far more than a thousand words. Um, what are the Saudis looking for? In my view, answers to five specific questions. Um, first, is President Biden, 
who has wanted to carry on President Obama's legacy in terms of renewing the Iran nuclear deal, for example, also going to carry on President Obama's legacy in other aspects of Middle East policy. Specifically, Saudis recall uh, President Obama's urging Saudi Arabia to share the Gulf with Iran. Or is President Biden coming to affirm the traditional US role of guarantor of Saudi security while urging greater regional cooperation and security integration? Secondly, is President Biden going to be focused solely in a transactional way in terms of a request to expand oil output? Or is he coming to propose a broader reset of the strategic relationship with Saudi Arabia that includes a defense and security package, including uh, arms sales that recognize that at least over the last 18 months during his presidency, Saudi Arabia has had a very positive role in Yemen, an issue that was the topic of President Biden's first foreign policy address when he became president um, uh, a year and a half ago. Third, uh, the question is the president coming to view the human rights and so through the lens of what happened to Jamal Khashoggi or the broader human development lens, a lens which includes everything from women's rights to personal freedoms to even some measure religious tolerance to actively fighting against the forces of extremism, which is something on which Saudis these days are extremely proud and committed. Fourth, um, Saudis note uh, that the president has underscored um, the, uh, uh, that Israelis have urged him to come to Saudi Arabia. Uh, and their question is whether uh, the president is going to press the case for normalization with Israel now, or will the, the White House and the Israelis recognize that this can be an, an incremental process, one in which an improved US-Saudi relationship is itself good for Israel? Recognizing that Saudi Arabia is in a very different position than, say, the Emirates in Bahrain were a year and a half ago, for whom the benefits of an open, full partnership with Israel were clearer, and the costs at least um, seemingly less problematic. Uh, Saudis recall, of course, they have their name attached to an Arab-Israel peace initiative, something that was never the case with most of the other Arab countries, which complicates their move along the spectrum toward normalization with Israel. And then fifth, uh, Saudis ask at a very fundamental level, is President Biden coming to check the Middle East box, a last gasp of American presence that is a bookend to what is viewed within the region as an ignominious withdrawal from Afghanistan? Or is he coming to say, even with the war of the Russian war against Ukraine, even with the rising challenge of China, even with our own domestic woes, that this place, this region matters, and that we in America will continue to invest what is necessary to ensure um, our common interest in regional stability and security. Now, my instinct is that if, um, if Saudis uh, receive even reasonably positive answers to these questions, they will respond in kind and then so. Though I think it is important to know we should have modest expectations about their near-term capabilities to pump huge additional amounts of oil, as my colleagues uh, at the Institute have pointed out in, in other analyses. Um, I think it's important to, uh, to underscore that on um, all said and done, uh, Saudi foreign policy today is generally less adventurous, less haphazard, less rogue than it was a couple of years ago. Um, uh, um, early, in the late Trump, early Biden um, period, there was a sense that the foreign policy was all over the map. Today, gone is any interest Saudis have in Lebanon. Gone is the 
uh, the, the, the counter cutter policy. I mean, it still resonates on some level, but it's not a crusade anymore. In its place, you have uh, the crown prince as a regional player, even trying to be a regional leader, having visited Cairo, Ankara, and Amman in preparation for this visit. In other words, I think the idea is to project Saudi Arabia in general and the crown prince specifically as a regional consensus maker, less a regional change maker. Um, all of this that we're talking about matters because the biggest issues in Saudi Arabia today are domestic. And those quixotic foreign entanglements were distractions at best from the main show, which is dramatic, persistent, and profound change. The enormity of which I don't think we've yet fully grasped or appreciated. The scale of what's going on in the country is amazing. Yes, in terms of infrastructure, uh, with so many mega projects that the term is beginning to lose meaning, but I'm referring to something deeper, uh, socio-cultural economic change. And from the beginning of this, advocates warned of blowback, of conservatives waiting to pounce, but the real blowback hasn't come. At least it's not yet obvious. To be sure, Sure, the government security services are very effective, but it's much deeper than that. This change is so popular among such a broad segment of the population that disaffected elements don't have the public support to make a stand. Of course, the government often does things shrewdly. Take, for example, a recent decision to end laws that demanded that all Saudi businesses close five times a day during Muslim prayer time. This was not announced as some grand religious reform, but rather as a commercial decision by the Minister of Commerce to give shop owners the right to choose to open or close as they saw fit. Viewed that way, the result, no blowback. Um, we're all talking about regional politics, but I, I think we have to expand the aperture. I think more reform is coming inside Saudi Arabia. And the question is what kind of reform? What kind of change? Uh, my favorite question to ask people during my recent trip was, what comes next? If there are three options of change, alcohol permits within certain tourism zones and establishments, without which it's clear that this huge investment in tourism will reach a natural wall, that's one. Second, loosening restrictions on non-Muslim prayer without which Saudi Arabia can't really attract the sort of CEOs and top, top executives. They want to move there to fulfill their goal of being the regional headquarters for global business. Or third, normalization with Israel, which is a clear goal of the leadership, but not nearly as important in the Saudi context as it was within the other Abraham reports. My, the first or the second, perhaps tentative, near term, formative steps to normalization. Yes, we may see the sorts of things that just talk about overflights, but the transformative types of steps are less likely, if for no other reason than those other two things, say alcohol permits or an, an incremental move toward non Muslim prayer. There, they will have a greater impact. If you can still see me, this doesn't mean You're there won't be other us. things. Um, uh, um, uh, 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 modest steps. And here I will note the very important messaging that just occurred this past week of assigning the most important religious sermon of the year, the khutbah on Yom al-Arafat during the Hajj to the maverick Sheikh Muhammad al-Isa, uh, the head of the World Muslim League, who's known for his interfaith efforts and condemnation of Holocaust denial, which was controversial but I think a very powerful message to peacemakers around the Middle East. Still, if you're looking for Emirati, Bahraini type of overnight normalization, 
I think it's not in the cards. So I hope President Biden opens the aperture on how he views Saudi Arabia. That doesn't mean avoiding the problems, the challenges, the areas of conflict, but more than two decades after 9-11, I think it means appreciating the enormity of what's at stake here and how it is so much in our interest to help move it along in a positive direction. Our interests as Americans, as well as, of course, the interests of the Saudi people. So that's those are my comments and expectation of the Biden visit. Um, uh, I'm very happy that we could have uh, my colleagues um, offer their remarks while I still haven't lost all my internet access. And now we're going to have a chance to turn to your questions um, and your comments. So um, first, if I could uh, uh, turn to Tamar, I know you made um, a general uh, um, uh, presentation about the spirit in which Biden will arrive in Israel. Can you help our viewers navigate some of the politics, perhaps you and Dennis, uh, to navigate some of the politics that President Biden will meet when he arrives there? New prime minister, a recently former, uh, recently prime minister in Bennett, and a would-be prime minister in Netanyahu, um, uh, other would-be prime ministers like Benny Gantz. How is President Biden going to navigate all these current and would-be prime ministers? That's one of the toughest, I think, for him to decide uh, who gets what in terms of, you know, friendly gestures, visits, dinners, and uh, what have you. Because, uh, well, I, I attended the Queen's uh, uh, Jubilee party um, a, a month ago at the, at the uh, British ambassador's uh, residence, and uh, um, Bibi Netanyahu arrived there and wanted to make a speech. But by the protocol, as the head of the opposition, he doesn't uh, have the right to make this uh, annual uh, uh, speech, but uh, someone of the incumbent government. And there was much tension in the air because he was refused. Uh, and I think that this is uh, just an example of uh, the issues that will have to be dealt with by the foreign ministry experts on, on such issues. Uh, certainly the fact that uh, Lapid uh, replaced Bennett only uh, 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 10 days ago or so uh, would put the, city, uh, the, the, the visit uh, in, in a very strange situation because uh, actually uh, uh, Bennett uh, made all the preparations in order to welcome him as Israel's prime minister and now he's out and Lapid is in. Um, and again, uh, Netanyahu Gantz right now, I mean, he has his uh, aspirations of becoming a prime minister, but he is not uh, a frontliner in, uh, 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 at least not, not right now, even if we take him and Gideon Saad together, they are still not a real competitor over uh, uh, the position of the largest party and, and who knows what the coalition would look like. But as I said, the situation is, is so, um, I would say, so volatile uh, that uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, many people at the foreign ministry are, are, are making the extreme effort not to offend anyone and not to cross any red lines. Um, and I'm sure some, some way out will be found, but I'm sure that there will be uh, at least certain politicians that will feel that they were not as respected as they should have been. <laughs> okay. Uh, Dennis, you're familiar with, with Biden's relationship over all these years with this broader array of, of Israeli leaders. How is he going to navigate this? Well, I think that, uh, look, I think that he will, first and foremost, respect the fact that uh, Lapid is now the prime minister. It's true that all the preparations were made earlier when Bennett was, but 
the, the reality that Lapid and Bennett are very close makes it also easier for Biden uh, to treat Lapid as his counterpart. He will no doubt see Bennett as well uh, as part of the discussion on Iran, because that is really Bennett has that as his as his portfolio. Uh, he's meeting Gantz. I think he will he will try to demonstrate that he is playing it straight. He, I think he will be acutely aware that it, he doesn't want to look like he's playing favorites, but the mere reality that he will spend more time with Lapid than anyone else, uh, that in a sense, even if he's playing it straight, it still has the benefit of, of enhancing Lapid's stature uh, in the role. Uh, he will see uh, former Prime Minister Netanyahu. They have a long-standing relationship. No doubt Prime Minister Netanyahu will try to demonstrate, look, I've always had a great relationship. He'll refer to him as Joe. Uh, there'll be an effort on his part to show the kind of informality of the relationship. Uh, and Biden will play to that. Biden will say, look, we've always been friends, but I wouldn't be surprised if Biden repeats one of his great lines with Bibi. You know, I disagree with everything you say, but I love you. Uh, and I wouldn't be at all surprised if, uh, if that's part of what emerges from the trip. But I would say the bottom line will still be, well, he'll see everybody, uh, including, by the way, he'll spend a lot of time with President Herzog. But I still think the one who will benefit the most from uh, time spent and will have the, the greatest amount of, of discussion time with him will be Lapid. And it will be done in a way that's very straight, done in a way that Biden tries to highlight more than anything else the fundamental commitment he has to Israel and how enduring that commitment is. Okay, thank you. Um, to Sam, a question for you that uh, came in. Um, uh, in his Washington Post op-ed, in which uh, he explained the rationale for his trip to the Middle East, um, President Biden unfortunately made no reference no specific reference to the Abraham Accords. Um, uh, is, there, um, uh, is there a sense um, where you are that the original hesitation um, that this administration was, you know, that may have characterized some people in the administration about embracing and achieving fully overcome for example, the Negev score. So, Ebdesam, I think you can, the, the thrust yeah. of his question had to do with President Biden not mentioning the Abraham Accords and does that in any way, does that play at all in the Emirates or do they see the trip in a larger perspective? Well, uh, uh, look, Dennis, uh, yes, but when I read the, the, uh, his article, yes, he did not mention Abraham Accord by, by, by name, but he talked about normalization as a, a, a base for this security cannot be achieved without cooperation, without normalization. Otherwise, we will be in a conflict and, and wars. And he didn't mention specifically. But I think uh, my guess that uh, he is going, because this is something the, the previous administration achieved. And it works fine with this administration. I mean, it's, it's nothing that what Trump did, which Biden don't like there is something in this which uh, can us benefit from it israel and the region i would say that he will he will not mention it in a name but he i think he will discuss it he will discuss this uh, in his meeting with the although the saudi maybe as as rob said they are they would not uh, be part of this but I think kind of cooperation in the region, which is not has been announced, is still there under the table. There are cooperation between the regional uh, actors, uh, 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 between Israel and, and, and the Arabs. This is, we know, all of us. We know. 
Um, Dennis, uh, a couple of questions for you about Iran and how it will be uh, handled throughout the um, uh, uh, the trip. Um, uh, one, um, uh, if indeed there's progress on these regional security initiatives, quiet progress on missile defense or, or anti-drone efforts, how are we supposed to anticipate the response from Iran? Iran, of course, gets a vote in all this too. Um, uh, how, do, how are the, the partners going to manage the likely Iranian response? And more generally, um, uh, um, uh, one viewer uh, reminded me that uh, when President Trump came to the Middle East, uh, the Iranians welcomed him with um, a couple of missiles headed toward, uh, uh, headed toward Riyadh. Um, are we likely to have the Iranians reminding everyone of, um, uh, uh, you know, that they are a major regional player by any actions sometime over the next few days? And perhaps Ibtissam has a comment on this as well. Uh, if I were uh, planning the trip for the administration, I would certainly be anticipating that, but I would also be sending messages to the Iranians very quietly and through a variety of different channels that if anything like that is done, uh, they're going to regret it. Uh, the Iranians should know that they could be running a risk that they really don't want to take on. Now, whether they'll take those private messages seriously, the administration makes the claim that uh, one of the reasons that the there's been a decline in the number of attacks uh, on American forces in Iraq and, and in Syria uh, in the last couple of months uh, is because they've passed certain messages. So uh, whether that's had an effect on the Iranians or not, uh, certainly the administration would be likely to do that. And I'm sure they've they've done it. The Iranians also have to think if they do something like that, uh, how does it play with the Europeans? Number one. Number two, does it not actually deepen the, the prospect that some of the countries in the region are bound to do much more with the Israelis and with the United States? So my guess is uh, all those factors will come into play. But as, a, as an old contingency planner, I would certainly be taking a number of steps right now, uh, including even moving some forces around for the Iranians to understand uh, if they do something like this, it could trigger a response, uh, number one. Number two, you know, I, I think that the, uh, the, the broader issue here of how the U.S. develops its, uh, this regional security uh, approach and integration, it is also a message designed to address one of the questions you raised, Rob. The administration, I think, in doing this is not only trying to address what is a real issue and threats from the Iranians and their proxies, but also trying to send a signal, this is the Biden administration, it's not the Obama administration. Uh, there isn't going to be any impulse to say you have to share the region with the Iranians. There is no, one doesn't see uh, a set of false expectations about who the Iranians are or what they might become. There are no sort of hopes that uh, if you get back in the JCPOA, it's going to somehow uh, tame other Iranian behaviors or they will become more reasonable. Uh, there were hopes in 2015 that that was the case. Now, obviously, it turned out not to be the case. Uh, and I think in the, uh, in the Biden administration, some of what you're seeing is a deliberate effort to answer that question. We're Biden and we're not going to turn a blind eye to threats in the region. The fact that there's a difference on whether to get back into the JCPOA or not, which is true not just for the Israelis, but others in the region, uh, tends to increase the impulse of the administration now to prove that it can be a good regional partner. I have no doubt that one of the things that those in the region will hear is that we've not withdrawn forces from the region. We retain the largest amount of forces uh, in the region. And this effort at regional integration, as I said earlier, the irony for those in the region who want to see more demonstration that the U.S. is going to be committed and not pulling away, the more we emphasize regional integration under our umbrella, it requires us to be more involved, not less involved. The fact that others will be assuming a greater responsibility also makes it easier for us to sustain our involvement. So these are, you know, this is, these are two hands that basically re reinforce each other and I think are going to be very much a part of the of the Biden message. Okay. If, if, Sam, do you want to uh, make a comment about 
security may impact on uh, on Iran? Well, uh, I want to mention something first, uh, Rob. Uh, this administration should show that it has Plan B, because. Why this attack against the US interests, against its allies? Because they know there is no plan B, the Iranian no. So there is no red lines for, for, for them. The second point, now, there is different uh, perspective from the Iranian and, and, and the American regarding why they are uh, uh, going to negotiate again for the nuclear deal. The Iranian wants the sanction to be lifted. The American thinks that this is, uh, will bring the stability and security in the region. The Iranian, this is not their goal or their aim, the security of the region. They look to the, this is from a different angle, the security of the region, meaning Iranian hegemony. Okay, so also this is should be in, in their consideration. And the other thing that if the American also thinking that by reaching uh, the, the nuclear deal, Iran will stop its activity in the region, it will not. It's invested heavily in its proxies, uh, invested heavily in its missile and 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 drone uh, programs. This is what we are always saying. Please also look to the other things which is threatening us in the, uh, in the region and to be part of that or to, to be another step for uh, not lifting the, the whole sanctions just because of the nuclear deal. The other things that without conditionality on that uh, money is going back to Iran after if if we assume that we are reaching a deal without conditionality on that money, where it will go? Because 2015, all this money went to create, to spend on more militias, new militias, new proxies for the Iranian and more malign activities and on its uh, drone and uh, missile uh, program. Without this, we will not reach stability and security, which uh, uh, Biden emphasized in his uh, article. I might just add, Rob, that uh, the Israeli attitude is very similar to what Eptisam was describing. They will be pressing for where is your plan B and what, it, what will it consist of on the one hand, but they will also be saying if you go back to the JCPOA, you're going to be giving dramatic amounts of resources to the Iranians so they can cause far more trouble. If they can cause all this trouble in the region now when they're under sanction, Im imagine how much more they will do when they're not. That will be very much a part of the Israeli theme as well. True. But we lost Rob. Robert. He's off? Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, so look, uh, Rob. Apparently, we've lost we've lost Rob, but that doesn't mean we we have to end. We have a few more minutes. Uh, in any case, uh, tomorrow I might just ask you a question. Do you think that the uh, the the Biden trip will have any real impact politically on the election? Can it be of help to Lapid if he's given greater exposure? Is that within the cards right now? I'm not sure about it. I think that, of course, he will play by the rule and spend much time with uh, Lapid as uh, the, the, the prime minister. But I don't see it as something that can make Lapid more respectable or more thought of as a, as a, a, a heavyweight politician. Right now, he has a problem in, in really positioning himself as an important player in the international community. And I don't think that this visit, uh, uh, which as I said, is perceived more as symbolic and, and by the protocol, 
will uh, uh, really enhance his uh, uh, posi Lapid's position as, as a highly qualified player on the international uh, uh, level. So uh, um, I, I think that in a way it's, it's, um, it's also a burden because right now everyone is uh, deeply into dealing with the domestic politics affairs that are changing uh, a day by day, like this new alliance between Tsar and, and Gans and so on and so forth. And now Lapid, uh, until next week, will be preoccupied with the visit and, 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 and the implications of the visit, because of course, once President Biden goes to Mecca, the, uh, to Jeddah, then, then everyone will be following him and what's happening there. So Lapid will not be able to deal with what's happening uh, on the ground here. Uh, so for him, it is not exactly the right time to, to uh, I would say, uh, too fresh in, 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 in the position and too preoccupied with some minor but very critical issues as far as the upcoming elections are, are concerned. Okay, so Rob, I see you're back. Yes, okay. Um, so uh, I just wanna be able to um, sum up because our time is uh, about to run out. So a final, uh, a final uh, set of uh, uh, what I'll call a lightning question um, to all of you. Um, I know you've signaled it in some of your opening remarks, but uh, by the end of this week, President Biden will have come and gone from, uh, from Israel, uh, 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 Palestinian areas, and Saudi Arabia. Uh, by the end of this week, um, uh, do you think that uh, um, uh, uh, we will collectively, um, whether it's Arab countries, Ibtisam, Israel, um, uh, Tamar, uh, or even the foreign policy elite here in the United States, Dennis, have a uh, clearer understanding of where the president is on issues of regional security. So uh, why don't, I think Rob is frozen again. So uh, Epsom, why don't you, uh, Epson, why don't we start with you, then Tamar, and then I'll I'll wrap up uh, and answer to Rob's question. Uh, I think before the visit, there are many visits from the administrations, uh, Bert McCork, uh, Blinken, before this visit. So it paved the ground for uh, that, what, what both sides want from each uh, others. I think there might be some agreement on the oil uh, prices and, and, and this is surely, and there would be assurance from uh, the US side about their uh, commitment for, to, to peace and stability and security in the region, which is before uh, has been perceived that US is leaving uh, the region. And, and, and uh, Biden stated that in his uh, article. Uh, maybe some differences on how this will be materialized that in, uh, but for sure, the assurance of defense system will be given, at least I know for UAE, okay? And there will be that uh, kind of formula for a defense. Now, are they are going to agree on a NATO, Middle, Middle East NATO or not? But there will be some collaboration between all the uh, regional actor under the auspices of uh, U.S. Thank you. Tamar? I tend to believe that the sides know very well who thinks what. And uh, the only thing that uh, I uh, expect is that there will be some, you know, like when you come to visit, you bring some goodies, in order to show your good intentions. So there might be some minor issues that will be raised for maybe the first time uh, on the face-to-face -face meetings with Lapid, for example, or uh, 
uh, with others, mainly with Lapid, perhaps, in order, as you said, to give him some, some, some open support by the president. But uh, I think that everything uh, is, is now before him. Okay. Uh, look, I would just say I think uh, the foreign policy elites here will draw the conclusion that the Biden administration is uh, is not pivoting away from the Middle East per se, uh, and that it has shored up its position generally with its more traditional partners in the region. But there'll still be lots of questions because one trip isn't going to transform everything. And we still have to see what's going to happen with the JCPOA. I'm not one of those who think that it's it's over with. I suspect it may it may still come back uh, in one form or another. Uh, Rob, I don't know if, if you're back and you want to make any final comment. I saw you there briefly. Uh, if if not, let me thank Evdesam and Tamar. It was a really interesting discussion and. We should get together again in the aftermath of the trip at some point to make some judgments about uh, what we actually saw, not just what we predicted. Thank you very much for, for joining us and thank Rob, wherever you are. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.